Welcome. Thank you to the Apprenticeship Employment Network for hosting the National Skills Week Industry Workshop. Never before has skills reform been more critical to our nation. Ensuring our workforce has the skills we need for the jobs of the future is critical for rebuilding our economy, especially in the post-COVID environment. Collaboration between government, industry and the community will be vital to the success of our recovery. And it goes without saying that the Morrison government is committed to supporting Australians to stay and work. However, we also need Australians better trained for the jobs needed. And to do that, we need real reform when it comes to skills training in Australia. So we have prioritised skills development as part of the job maker strategy, which is designed to set Australia up for the economic success over the next three to five years. Our multi-billion skills package provides a significant boost to the vet sector. This includes our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy that is providing timely, targeted and scalable support to businesses to keep on their existing apprentices and trainees. This builds on the establishment of the National Careers Institute and the National Skills Commission. These two organisations are working together to strengthen, streamline and improve the delivery of and access to careers information in Australia. Again, I'd like to thank the Apprenticeship Employment Network for hosting this industry workshop and I hope that you enjoy today's session. Thanks. Uh, what I'm going to run through today, just very briefly about accessing super, both the normal method and the uh, early access method. Uh, a bit about investments, uh, what's happened recently in the markets, certainly earlier in the year everything was um, falling apart to some degree, which many people uh, saw as a problem. And then just a couple of, one major uh, policy change, not so much policy change, rule change uh, that regards superannuation. So. Please remember that what I'm talking about is general information only. Um, I can't tell you what you should be doing or what you shouldn't be doing, uh, but I can certainly talk to you about uh, what you can do and what you can't do. And as I said before, if people got questions or something, uh, jump in and uh, we'll tackle them. So accessing super, probably the buzzword of the last couple of months, uh, this early access to super. What I thought I'd do is start with what is the normal access to super, um, when you can uh, get your hands on your super as normal. Uh, so it all comes down to your preservation age. So the government puts super into this bucket that gives its tax concessions along the way, but then limits when you can get it. So for getting uh, early access, which I'll talk about in a moment, to get, get your hands on your super, you must cease work and have reached your preservation age, which is shown here. Now, most of us are heading towards that preservation age of 60. Uh, some might be in this meeting uh, looking at a preservation age of less than 60. And that's when, as long as you stop work, you can access your super and you can do with it what you want. There's no rules around how you must spend your super. You can spend it wisely or you can spend it unwisely. It's only going to last as long as or depending on how quickly you can spend it. So access to super is available if you cease work. Now, if you cease work after the age of 60, that's all you need to do. Uh, if you cease work between your preservation age and 60, you do tick a box that says, it is your intention at that point of time never to work again. So never to work again is a fairly broad definition but it means if you filled out one form on Friday that you're never going to work again and then start a new job on the Monday and filled out a new uh, tax file declaration and those forms cross the tax office, uh, they might show a bit of interest in you. But it was never your intention to work again and I've never seen a time frame put on it, but a couple of months later you decide to go back to work because you needed to, you wanted to, whatever it is, uh, there's probably not going to be any investigations going on into your situation. So some people, and we know many people have lost their jobs through the whole impact of COVID-19, some people might be eligible to access their super under the regular terms, under the normal reasons. They've ceased work and they've reached their preservation age. But what we found uh, going forward, uh, COVID-19 gave us early access to super. And it came in two tranches. Uh, the first one was before the 30th of June this year, you could access up to $10,000. Uh, that has, of course, passed in, with, with time. 
but we're in another situation where you can access up to another $10,000 between now and the end of the uh, calendar year. So up to 10,000 doesn't mean you have to take the 10,000. What you take is tax free. Now you might crystallise losses or gains of investment earnings over that period, but there's no tax applied on the benefit uh, you wish to access. And it's all done through your MyGov account. So it's all monitored by the tax office. Uh, you state to the tax office that you meet the criteria uh, that you, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then it's up to you, like with your tax return, to prove uh, that the deductions you claimed were legitimate. So if we look at uh, what the, the rules are, uh, to be eligible, you've got to meet one of these criteria. Unemployed, eligible to receive various uh, different payments, or since January, uh, your working hours have been reduced, you've been made redundant, even if a sole trader and your reduction of turnover has been 20% or more, you can put your hand up and say, yes, I'm eligible to access this money. Now, accessing the money, as I said, done through the tax office. Um, I'll go backwards that one. But it will potentially have an impact on future savings. So taking the money out now is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. There are many people who need to access that money. But the younger you are, the greater the impact it's going to be on your end benefit. And this is what this chart shows. The younger you are, and if you took both 10,000 uh, accessible limits uh, this financial year and last financial year, that's the impact it's going to have on your account balance. Now, it doesn't look like a big figure, but it is in today's dollars. So $64,000 for a 25 year old, that is $64,000 in 42 years. So it's what $64,000 will buy today. If you, if you took the inflation into account, it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of dollars less. But we've taken inflation out and brought it into today's terms so people can actually see what it's gonna cost. So the younger you are, the greater the impact it's gonna be. But as I said, if there is a need for it, uh, it is your money. It's just being deferred uh, accessibility to it. So there is an impact on uh, your future retirement savings. Now, whether you can get that money back in, uh, it's going to depend on a lot of factors going into the future, uh, your ability to put money into super, all those sort of things. Uh, but it is there. There is going to be an impact down the, down the track. It might also affect your insurance cover. So with most people with their superannuation fund, they've got insurance tied to it. If you take all your money out and close your account, you're gonna lose that insurance cover. So the insurance cover is generally for death, permanent disability, maybe income protection. Three essential in insurances that people probably overlook a little bit when it comes to their super. They understand the super might be this bank account that they're gonna get some money at the end of the day. Uh, but there is insurance tied to it. You've got to be aware that if you do, as I say, take all your account out, uh, you're going to lose that insurance. Or you might want to just take enough out that you can maintain a level of benefit within the super account to pay for the insurance costs. New contributions might not be going in, but you leave enough in the superannuation account to cover the cost of premiums. Now, on average, uh, what people have been withdrawing, and these are the uh, statistics the ABS have, and Australian super figures fairly much uh, mirror them. The average balance of people, the average account that people have accessed early has been about $7,500. So this probably means that uh, it is people with smaller accounts accessing it, uh, and people not having the enough money in super to access 10,000 in the previous financial year and 10,000 in, in this financial year. So be aware of your insurance if you are uh, accessing your super account. There are some penalties and every now and then we see this in the press that if you told Porkies and said you were eligible when you weren't, uh, the tax office is gonna come down hard on you. And they're gonna come down hard on you in two ways. The first way is they're going to say that that money you took out of super, the, let's say I took the $10,000 out, that $10,000 now becomes a taxable income. So I'm up for my marginal tax rate. 
on that amount I took out. So if I took out $10,000 early and I wasn't eligible for it, and my, I make it nice and easy for my maths, if my marginal rate was 40 cents in the dollar, I've got to stump up $4,000 as tax. Then they might fine me as well, and the fines can be up to $12,500. So it could be a quite expensive exercise. Uh, again, some stats came out earlier in the year that showed about 30% of people weren't using the money as the government thought they would. Uh, they've used it on holidays or boats or liposuction in some cases. Uh, I don't know how they work all this out, but if they're questioned, uh, I hope the holiday was worth it because there's going to be a tax bill and a potential fine uh, if the ATO comes comes looking for you. Now, that's all the access. I'm, I talked before about accessing your super normally once you've reached preservation age, but there are ways you can access your super earlier than your preservation age through either compassionate grounds or severe financial hardship. Now, compassionate grounds are listed here. These are the, uh, the situations you can be in when you can access your money before preservation age if you've got one of these things uh, pending. So the, the early release was a very simple process. Uh, this tends to be a longer process because it needs to be a bit of approval uh, along the lines here, but you can access uh, super for compassionate grounds. You can also access your super before your preservation, day, uh, preservation age along uh, what is called severe financial hardship. Now, severe financial hardship has a couple of ways it is, it is determined. Uh, for anyone, it uh, doesn't matter what age you are, you can access up to $10,000 uh, gross. Now, there is going to be tax payable on that. I'll talk about the tax on super a bit later on, but you can access up to $10,000 in any 12 month period. Now, to access it, you've got to meet this criteria. You've got to be on uh, government support for at least six months. And you've got to be able to, it's, it's for living day to day. It's not that you can't make the repayments on that new boat you just bought. That's not severe financial hardship. It is severe financial hardship along the lines of, of what's represented here. If you are slightly older, uh, there are some different definitions around what you can access. Uh, so if you've reached a, a certain level of age, you've reached a preservation age, plus 39 weeks. So where these numbers come from, there are, is some basic logic for it, but you don't need to know that. But if I've reached my preservation age, plus 39 weeks, there's no upper ceiling on it. Uh, again, I have to meet a number of criteria before the uh, payments paid out. And I've got to be a permanent uh, resident. I can't be a, a temporary uh, resident. So there are ways to access your super. The normal way, let's say you reach your preservation age, you stop work. Uh, the early access, which the government's in, instigated due to COVID-19, or potentially this compassionate or financial hardship. So again, in the areas you work, there may be people, maybe apprentices and trainees, that this might be an option for them. Uh, they might have seen, well, I'm in, I'm in dire straits. Uh, I've accessed my $10,000, I've accessed whatever I can, and I'm still having trouble paying the bills. Here's a way that uh, these people can access through financial hardship or compassionate grounds, uh, their super. If they're older and they've reached preservation age, they might be able to access all their super. Now, tax on super, uh, great if you're over 60. So if you're over 60, it's tax free. If you're between preservation age and 60, uh, the first 215,000 generally is tax free, and you're gonna pay 15% plus Medicare on anything above that. So if I had 250 and took the 250, 215,000 is tax free, and I'm gonna pay uh, 17%, 15 plus Medicare, on the other 35. If I'm under preservation age, it's gonna be taxed at 20% plus Medicare. So they really whack you with a stick if you can access money under preservation age. Generally, the only money you can access under preservation age is, the own, is your money that you've put in in past years, or since uh, 83. 
uh, that was your contributions as an after-tax contribution. Uh, you can access that, but you may be up for tax of, of 20% plus Medicare. And again, you might want to get financial advice around this. We can always tell you how much potential tax you're going to pay if you do want to access it, uh, because if you do want to access it and you're under 60, uh, there could be some tax on it. But as I was saying before, there's a good chunk of that benefit that is going to be tax-free. I'm going to move on to investments, uh, just making sure we're on time here. Um, investments, I said, a real slump in the market, uh, February through to March. Uh, the market's dropped about 30%, which we have seen before, but it was the pace of the drop that caught everyone by surprise this time. It dropped 30% in five weeks, and it wasn't something that we saw coming as such, it was something that we anticipated was going to happen, but not in that time frame. So we saw, we saw markets actually plummet uh, from mid mid February to, to mid March. Now, with investing, it's all about risk versus return. Uh, Australian Super has a default option called our balanced option. This is how it's invested. It's spread across a range of assets. So we're diversifying. Uh, the more you diversify, the the less risk you have. Uh, you do trade off returns for lower risk. And in the case of Australian Super's balance fund, over half of it's in shares, in equities, because we know over the longer term, equities historically have provided better returns. Now, I'm not saying past or future guarantees future performance. I haven't got a crystal ball to say what's going to happen in the future. But we do have over half the balanced option invested in shares. We then have uh, money invested in what we call the ballast of the fund, that, that mid-risk investment such as property, infrastructure, uh, private equity. And then we'll always have a proportion in cash and fixed interest. Now, cash and fixed interest are at levels we've never seen before. I doubt there's anyone in this meeting that have seen interest rates as low as this or mortgage rates as low as this. Uh, it is part of a, a longer cycle. We are in a very, or we're going to be in a very uh, low interest rate period for a number of years to come. And that's good if you've got a loan, not so good if you're wanting investment returns. And this is where we try to define the difference between saving and investing. Saving is protecting the money you've got. Investing is making that money you've got grow. So there's a slight, uh, there's a fairly easy definition of those. People struggle sometimes with that definition and often they'll retire and they'll put all their money into savings mode, forgetting that they still need that money to earn uh, whilst they're in retirement. So it's that balance between what you have in savings, what you have in growth. And the balanced option is, probably a seven out of 10 on the riskiness scale when it comes to, to growth assets. About three quarters of the fund are in growth assets and only about a quarter in conservative assets. And we do this because we want that growth over the 20, 30, 40 years you're going to be working and accumulating super, but also in the 20 or 30 years that you're potentially going to be in, retiring, in retirement, but you still need that money to grow. So the Australian Super Balance Fund has been performing very well. We're very happy with the way it's performing. We just snuck into the positives uh, for the financial year just gone, uh, 0.52. The average, which is the grey on the graph here, is the average of the, or the medium of the top 50 super funds. So the average fund lost money, lost nearly 1%. Uh, Australian Super, we're happy to say we got just over half a percent. Short term is sells papers and whether it's good or bad, short term does that. Long term is really where the game's at because your superannuation is a long term investment. So over five, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we've consistently outperformed that average. And on average, it's about 1% or so. And 1% difference over a working life can be at something like $100,000 at the end of the day. Uh, long term, really long term, we can go back to our inception rate, which goes right back to 85. We just celebrated our 35th anniversary, uh, averaging over 9% over that period. So the balance fund is, is really performing well. Uh, it does have ups and downs. It's been positive since the GFC. As I said, though, we just snuck into the positives this year. 
but it's that comparative figure against what the average fund's doing that we're, we're very proud of the way that the funds progressed. Um, often we see when there's volatility in the market, people change investments, they go to conservative. And this is just looking at the last 12 months and, and looking at the balance fund being the orange line, we can see everything was wonderful up until about the middle of February. Uh, markets fell sharply and people often do a switch and they'll switch out of the balance fund into a safest option such as cash. Unfortunately, they often leave that money there and don't get the bounce. Now, we don't know when a bounce is going to come. We can't guarantee a bounce will come, but in the past, we've always, always seen a bounce. And the bounce was quite quick and got it back about half of what it had dropped in the, the last three months of the year. So the orange line shows what you know, the 100,000 grew to by the end of the year. And the yellow line is if you bailed out of the balance fund to cash on the 18th of March or the 23rd of March, which is really the bottom of the cycle. And it shows that investing for the long term is what super is all about. That's how we design the investment portfolio. We design it for the long term. We know there's going to be ups and downs along the way. No one ever switches out to a safer investment when there's an up because we're always confident it's going to go further up. But often people do bail out when things go down because they don't want to lose any more. Now, in theory, that's great as long as you go back in before the bounce comes. Now, if we don't know when the, when the drop's going to happen, we certainly don't know when the recovery is going to happen. The way to uh, sustain or make sure you get the ups and endure the downs is to stay invested in that option. So this is just looking at over the last 12 months. If we go back further and look at how 50,000 has grown over the last 20 years, uh, you can see all sorts of ups and downs along the way. We've got the GFC uh, that really smashed markets. Uh, probably the biggest drop and the longest drop and the longest recovery we've had, even we go back to 87, which is a big crash before then, uh, the GFC uh, was a far longer dip. And you see a couple of dips along the way, whether it was the Greek crisis, uh, Brexit, uh, the trade wars between the US and China, and then finally at the very end there, they got the dip of the impact of COVID-19. But it just shows how 50,000 has quadrupled over those last 20 years. Now, the last 11 years, yes, have all been positive and is probably a longer positive period than we'd ever expect. Uh, we don't knock it back. We, 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 we do like those ones, uh, but it does show the importance of staying invested over that longer term. So that's just the balance fund. That's where about 80% of our membership is. So if you're an Australian super member, uh, there's a good chance you're in our, our balanced option. Now, we do have other investment options depending on your investment tolerances to risk. We have pre-mixed options where we decide what that pie chart looks like. We have do-it-yourself options where you can make up your own pie chart, where you can combine DIY and the pre-mixed options however you want. You can change it every day. I uh, certainly don't recommend you do that, but you can if you wish. Uh, if it all goes horribly wrong, don't come looking for me. Uh, and make your own investment choice. Uh, we've got, as I said, we've got about 85% of our memberships in balance. 15 years ago, it was about 95%. So in the last 15 years, 10% of our membership are making investment choices. Now, whether they make the right choices or the wrong choices, only time will tell. The key thing is to make a choice that you're comfortable with, that you understand what the investment objectives are of the fund. So the investment objectives of the balance fund is to earn inflation plus 4% over a 10 year rolling average. So we've certainly done that over the last 20 years. It's well above that, that uh, CPI plus uh, four. In the last year, well, it's a one year figure. Um, CPI is probably very low, again, lowest as we've seen for a while, but we measured over that 10 year period. So the ups and the downs uh, cancel each other out to a certain degree. So each of these investment options has its own investment objective and it has its own risk. Uh, the balance fund statistically can be expected to have a negative year four or five times out of every 20 years. Now, we had a negative way back in 2008, 2009. Uh, 
Before that, the previous negative was back in 87. So these negative amounts doesn't always happen every four or five years, but that's the, uh, I suppose, the probability. It's like tossing a coin. It should be 50-50, uh, but you might get six or seven heads in a row before you get six or seven tails. But if you keep on tossing the core coin for infinity, it would probably be 50-50 because that's the, the probability. Now, all these different pre-mixed options uh, have had a lower return for the past year. But again, superannuation is that long-term investment and you compare it to the 10-year uh, returns, you can see that each of the options fits its uh, investment objective, so to speak. The higher the risk, the higher the return, the lower the risk, the lower the return. So something like the high growth fund is probably a nine out of 10, where stable would only be a three out of 10, because the stable investment doesn't have as much invested in those uh, in equities and private equity and property and infrastructure. It has a lot more in shares, oh sorry, in, in fixed interest and cash. So you can see in the year gone by, when there was a bit of volatility, the stable and the conservative balanced had a far greater return than the balanced option for that one year. But over the 10 years, there's a one or 2% difference. And that's just what we'd expect because that then fits in with the investment objectives of those options. What's gonna happen? Um, well, we haven't got a crystal ball as I said before, but markets did recover very quickly. We are in an area due to COVID-19 that has shaken things up. Uh, it's really, not so much trying to cat among the pigeons, but it's certainly getting people in the investment area to focus on what's going to recover. What's going to recover first? When we look at what happened uh, earlier this year, markets crashed, markets recovered. Which markets recovered best? Technology companies, because technology was this type of thing. Uh, the Zooms of the world, uh, pro, uh, Google, all those sort of things. Uh, what suffered? Air travel, for example, uh, holidays, all those sort of things. So where you see uh, drops, there are going to be opportunities and uh, Australian Super is certainly looking at where those opportunities will lie. We're not gonna diverge greatly from our long-term uh, investment goals because they are long-term and things like this happen every now and then. How we recover is really uh, something the future holds for us, but certainly our investment people, we've got about nearly 200 of them, uh, are certainly looking to see how that's gonna change down the future and where those, those opportunities lie. That wraps us up for investment. I just wanna to touch on a change of legislation that kicked in as at the 1st of April this year. And it's called putting members' interests first. It's uh, a change to protect small balances by erosion from insurance costs. So I mentioned before that superannuation is a glorified bucket of money that's gonna grow and grow and grow and has insurance tied to it. And it has a, and most super funds will have a basic default level of insurance cover that provides a benefit in case something nasty happens. Because it's providing a benefit, there is a premium. Now the government changed the rules back in April to say that a superannuation fund cannot provide that basic level of cover if the member's paying for it. So if it's coming out of the member's account, it can't provide that basic cover unless the individual is over the age of 25 and they have $6,000 in their super balance. So these are numbers and ages that just came from, I wouldn't say from nowhere, with some sort of uh, rationale that the under, average under 25 year old might not need insurance because they don't need a uh, benefit, they haven't got a substantial debt, they haven't got a significant other, that sort of thing. But it will affect. Uh, many people going into superannuation or changing jobs and changing superannuation where they had insurance cover with super fund A, they moved to superannuation fund B, and in superannuation fund B, they might not get that cover straight away because of these new rules. They might be under 25, 
They might not have an account balance of 6,000. If I start a new account here, um, I haven't got to have $6,000 in there from day one. I might have more than $6,000 in an old super fund that I can move across, but if I move across, I might lose my insurance cover with that old fund. So it is an area that, it, it's not collateral damage as such, but it is a situation where people have got to think a little bit more about their super, especially younger people under the age of 25, which might be a significant uh, chunk of the apprentices and trainees that you have. So I suppose when we talk to the field officers down the track, and I think the field officers uh, conference is going to go ahead in some sort of way, uh, we'll be talking to them about this, because it might not affect the average person, but it might affect one in 10, one in 20. And it's important that they know what these rules are. From a personal point of view, you might be under age 25. You might have an account balance less than 6,000. You've started a new superannuation fund and you haven't got insurance cover. So it's worthwhile to review what you've got. You can always put your hand up and say, I want that basic cover from day one. You still have that potential. And you tick a box on a form. Now, whether it's with us or another superannuation fund, the option is there for you to pick up insurance cover when you want it. All of what I've spoken about ties into help and advice. Um, my role as education manager with Australian Super is to help people understand how the system works, how the, how the various investments work, how insurance, what the options are, all that sort of thing. Advice kicks in when you want someone to help you make a decision. I can give you the information, I can't tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I can tell you what you can and can't do. Over the phone, online, face-to-face -face or e-meeting, uh, depending on where you are, uh, we want to help you make those decisions. And it might be a simple question about an investment option or an insurance choice. But 1300 300 273 starts you on that road uh, if you want to get uh, advice about your super. That brings me to the end. I will stop sharing my screen if I can do that and uh, open it for questions that people might have. I suppose one thing that we, we want to do and what we have been doing, as I said it before, we are happy to run these sort of sessions for your organisation. So whether we jump in for a five or 10 minute slot just to talk about some of those important things, uh, we can do that virtually. Uh, where you are in Australia, um, Depends where we can get to you, but in Victoria, unfortunately, we're in lockdown, and I think we will be for a while. But we can certainly run these sort of things as a Q&A, as part of a, a monthly, fortnightly, quarterly, whatever meeting you're having with staff, uh, especially the insurance staff, because it is important. Uh, and we might find that people think they've got insurance cover and they haven't. Uh, the investment sort of stuff, well, that's some long-term stuff, but um, happy to be available, as I said before, you can get on to me and I can get my team on to uh, having a chat with you. But thanks for the time.